before I pray, let me send my greetings from Brooklyn Baptist Church and the saints there. I love coming to your church. I've said this before, but you are the, of all the churches I know, you are the most similar to our church, both in the building makeup and the congregational makeup. We just are very similar churches. Uh, Matt's a better preacher than I am. That's the thing that I can say is a distinction. But other than that, we are very, very similar churches. We really are. I can just, uh, from talking to Matt and knowing your body and seeing your body in the building, Brooklyn Baptist looks very, very similar. Very similar. Uh, it's, it's a joy to be with you. I have my wingman, Jeremiah. As he said, I was in the Air Force as a chaplain. That's an Air Force term. I can't go alone, so I put my son, my lovely daughter, and my other son could not come since they had parts of the service there. My wife, she just would rather hear Matthew Schwartz, so I couldn't persuade her to come either. I actually spent quite a bit of time with Matthew this week because we were together at a conference in Louisville. That's always the way it works. You go somewhere five states away, and then some you can spend some time with one another. My wife is so busy, but it was a joy to be with your pastor, Matthew, and I am pleased to be with you. The privilege, of course, is my congregation is to have him preach, and I hope I will be in some way a blessing to you. Let's pray. Show us Christ. Show us Christ. Oh God, reveal your glory. This is my humble petition. To see Christ in an unfamiliar book to us, maybe, the book of Leviticus. I pray as we look in the details of the book, we will see because of the trees, the forest, which is Christ. We will see in the details all things which pertain and testify to Jesus Christ. I pray He is seen and glorified this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. It is an unusual book maybe to preach from, the book of Leviticus. But before we do, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, read verses 23 through 26. A more familiar passage in the book of Leviticus, but it is referring to the book of Leviticus. The Old Testament is the promises given. The New Testament are the promises fulfilled. We do not understand the New Testament. We just can't comprehend it unless we understand what the Old Testament is promising. We cannot understand Hebrews 9, 23 through 26, lest we understand Leviticus. We just cannot. Hebrews 9, verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copy, for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, these rituals. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Already, copies, rituals, better things. There's something and then there's something else. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all as the end of the ages and put away by the sacrifice of himself. An overview of the book of Leviticus explaining Hebrews 9, 23 through 26. Let me explain to you my better half. My wife's name is Dana. And years before we were married, which oddly is coming up on 20 years. That's how old I am. Unbelievable. Years before we were married, we were dating, and on my desk at work, in my wallet, before my phones, oh my goodness, I had, and even in my car, a photo of my wife, photos of my wife, and I love those photos. I would gladly show someone a photo of my wife. I would say, here's my wife, here's my fiancé. Here's the girl that I'm going to marry. I was very, very proud of the photo. I was very happy to show it. I did not think that there was anything wrong with the photo. I was glad to show it. It was happy for me to do so. But then our wedding day came. We stood before family and friends. We pledged our lives to one another. 
suddenly I gone, I went from a one-dimensional representation of my life, which I loved, suddenly I went from a one-dimensional representation of my wife to a three-dimensional person whom I could love. Nothing wrong with a photo, but I'd much rather have a person. What would you think if I went to my wife this week and said, Honey, I really have enjoyed these 19 or so years. I really have. But I'm going to go back to the photo. <laughs> I mean, the photo, I mean, it's just this really, really good looking likeness. I'm going to go back to the photo. Uh, I would have no dinner and I would be put into a straitjacket. How crazy. That's silly. Why would you want a photo over me? Why would anyone want a photo over the real thing? Pictures serve purposes, and in and of themselves, they are wonderful. But pictures point to something else, do they not? There's nothing wrong with a photo, save the fact that it wasn't supposed to be the thing. In our home, we recently got a dog. Oh my goodness, don't do it. <laughs> we love our dog. We love all that he is for our family. But now I'm starting to think just the opposite. The idea of the picture of the dog would have been better than the thing. <laughs> but it is not. The dog is better than all of our anticipation and pictures of him. Finally born, we got him, and now we have him. We love the dog. The thing is better than the picture. Understanding that will be the heart, foundation, cornerstone to the book of Leviticus. If you ask an average Abraham, a little boy named Abraham, a little boy named Joshua, a little boy named Levi, Levi, do you love the Old Testament sacrifices? You wouldn't use the word Old Testament. Do you love the sacrifices you made? Oh yes, because of God's grace, because of the sacrifices, we have fellowship with God. He would have loved those things. He loved the sacrifices because they were the means by God gave these people that they could fellowship with Him. He thought nothing of it. But it was just a type. It was just a picture. It was never meant to be the real thing. It was only meant to point to something better, greater, more fulfilling. So when you look at the Old Testament, we cannot look at Scansley and say, oh, I can't believe they were like that. They loved it. They were thankful for it. But it was always pointing to something. Just by the way of introduction, three observations. One, if you and I were to look at these things, they would just be for us shadows. And that's what Hebrews says. The law is only a shadow of good things to come. It's a shadow. It's good, but a mere representation. Two, the law did, though, continue to bring guilt. Let's say someone was kind to you. Let's say I paid for your meal. That'd be nice. You would like that. But let's say every time we went out to eat, I paid. And one time I found out you were in a bind, and I said, I'll pay your rent. You would really appreciate that, I think. Thank you. But what if I paid your rent every month? After a while, all of my generosity and kindness to you, after a while, builds up almost an animosity. Almost a, what a, I mean, everything that I have, I have to owe to you. There's a guilt that can build up when someone's constantly kind kind to us. The scriptures say that repeatedly, over and over, every year, lambs, doves, pigeons, killed, bloodshed, bloodshed everywhere, all the time. Could you imagine a little boy named Levi? He is thankful for all those sacrifices. But after a while, all these animals continuously must die for my sins, to pay for my sins. And it's as if there was a guilt that is building up, and Hebrews alludes to that. It's like, can it continue to happen? Leviticus is pointing to us that this rampage of blood needs to have an end. Thirdly and lastly, I did like the wife picture, I did like the dog picture, but after a while, come on. I mean, if you've been dating someone for one, two, three years, enough is enough. I gotta get married. 
That's what I think also is the eight of the Old Testament saying thankful, glad, but where is the end? Eight. That's why you can understand why the angels said when Jesus was born, joy to the world. Joy, finally. He is here, the one who can end all that sacrifice. So what we will do this morning, by God's grace, is to do an overview of the whole book of Leviticus. And I hope it's an encouragement to you, ending with a magnification and a scene, not of the type, but of the reality. What do you think of when I say Leviticus? It's probably one of the most Old Testament, most neglected books of all the Bible, most neglected books of the Old Testament, it's an odd book in one sense, if I may say that about the scriptures respectfully. It's the least understood of all the Old Testament books, I think. How many of us have died in saying, this year I'm going to read through the Bible, Genesis, yeah, that's awesome. Eve, Garden, Abraham, Egypt, love it. Exodus, that's cool. Moses, parting the sea, got it. Leviticus. <laughs> Just die. You have this guilty pain of conscience. I want to skip the book, but that doesn't seem right. But I can't even understand it at all what I'm saying. And what about all these infinite details? Talk about, and again, I'm trying to be respectful here, but talk about OCD. What is the point of all of these minutia details? And we simply just die in the book. I have many a times, especially when I was a younger believer, died reading in the book. It's just stopped. Priests, sacrifices, lots, 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 lots of rules and details. What is going on? Why all the minutia? It is difficult also to embrace because it's not really a story. There's no real narrative in the book of Leviticus that we can latch onto. It's like an instructional man manual. And at least Ikea gives a little guide that shows how he's putting the temple together. That's not what you have here. You have no pictures. It's just an instruction manual. Line after line. Line after line. Line after line. Because I'm the Lord your God. Line after line. Line after line. Line after line. Because I'm the Lord your God. This is the refrain. This is the book of Leviticus. You don't need me to educate you on this. You have died in it reading it. What is happening? Here's what's happening. It's about the same place, same time, same basic context as Exodus. The people are there, leaving Egypt, heading for the promised land. They're marching along. God stops them in their marching. God stops. And for one full year, detail upon detail upon detail. Just think of that. You're an optimistic Israelite getting ready to go into the promised land after leaving the Passover. But God says, wait, yield, stop. One year of instruction at the mountain. One year of detailed instruction. That's exactly right. The book says this in Leviticus 1.1. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting. The Lord says, Moses, come. I'm going to give you instruction. Leviticus 1.1. Ready? The end of the book. Leviticus 27.34. These are the commands that the Lord gave Moses. See? One year. Moses, come. I'm going to give you instructions. 27 chapters later, a year later, these are the commandments and instructions the Lord gave Moses. That's what it is. It's a book of instructions. It's a year's worth of details. And that's why we have to spend some time wondering, what is this pit stop for? To do so, there's four sections of the book, all crescendoing, hopefully with the end which is Christ, the four sections of the book. I'll give them to you somewhat briefly. Here they are. Chapters 1 through 7 are laws, instructions about sacrifices, painstaking details. Ad infinitum, great tedium. I hope I'm not overly expressing to you the tedium and details found in Leviticus 1 through 7. God is shouting. Listen, friends. God is shouting that he 
is not indifferent about one tiny little thing that comes about fellowship in the Can you imagine what I'm saying to you? If you go see the queen, someone will, by rule, it has to happen, someone will stop you and say, here are, I don't know how many, seven things you must do. You must walk in, you must bow, you must step forward, bow. When you talk, you do not touch the queen. You never extend your hand to the queen. When you walk out, you bow, take a few steps back, you bow. Listen how simple that is. That's a few instructions to see the queen. God spends a year of instructions to say, I care about every single thing related about you coming near me. If you're going to be near me, we have a lot of things we need to cover. I am holy. You are not holy. If you want to be with me, near me, by me, you must follow these to the letter of the law. According to God, there are many and much instructions and details that you and I must do to try and, may I say the word, fellowship with Him. Leviticus 1 through 7. Leviticus 8 through 15, it's all about the priests. Boy, we're seeing Christ already. So you have to do all these infinite number of details and instructions, but you alone cannot do it. You have to have a mediator. There must be someone who represents man and someone who represents God. Jesus is a God man. You must have someone who will come to me on your behalf. And you must have someone on my behalf who comes to you. Even all those infinite details and instructions you cannot do. You must have a mediator. You must have a priest. One who is set aside solely for this purpose of reconciliation. He represents me. He represents you. He is, again, the middleman. Let's turn our Bibles to Leviticus 10 for a second. Leviticus 10. Important much? Big deal much? Big deal. Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 2. Aaron's sons, who were priests, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire. That was not what the instruction manual said. You did what you shouldn't have done. You broke from that year's instruction. You offered something that was unauthorized before the Lord, contrary to His command. So fire came out of the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died. Are you nervous yet? This instruction manual was given the priest, who was the right one to do it, did it wrong, and they died. That's carefulness. If you bow wrongly before the queen, you may make the news, and that's it. This priest came to offer an incorrect offering and death on the spot. What do you think Moses did? The text tells us what Moses did. Moses, verse 3. He gets on to him. Don't you remember the commandment? He didn't say, I'm sorry. He didn't say, man, God was really serious about that. He says, translation, Sam Gage, idiot. Don't you remember the commandment? By all who come near me, I will be regarded as holy. I tolerate nothing less. It's got to be exactly perfect. Now, what do you think Aaron's father, I mean, Adam and Milo's father thought about that? Verse 4. And Aaron held his peace. You just saw your sons die for doing one little thing wrong. They died. He doesn't complain. He's like, God said, that's the way it has to be. There's no fudging, no winking, no almost, not quite. Aaron held his peace. He could say nothing. God is holy. He has the right to say any standard at all that must be met to meet him. Wow, you can't fight with God. You can't tell God overreached. You can't tell God that he needs some latitude. You cannot tell God that he's being a little bit overly doing it. You can't play with God. He gave a requirement, and that requirement, without question, must be held. He's not a meter maid. 
If you give them a good sob story and really, really try to get out of that ticket, she might let you go. It's not going to happen. 100% of the time, this is the scam. God appointed priests for this to happen. Let's turn about the second Samuel, verse, chapter 6, verse 7. You see this kind of language pursued after the book of Leviticus, 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrated before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his hand of the Lord on the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. He tried to stop the ark, the ark from falling to the ground. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. You, in Leviticus, are told you cannot touch the ark. But the ark is going to fall. R.C. Sproul has a famous quote here. As if the dirt was less dirty than Uzzah's hand. You cannot touch the ark. Your intentions may be good. The law says no. The law revealed in Leviticus. If you want to be with God, you must obey God. You cannot touch the ark. Uzzah touches the ark. He dies. What is the root of this complexity for us in our soul? The root is this. Because grace is free, because grace is a gift, we tend to think that it's cheap. Grace costs God much. Though it is free to you and I, it cannot be handled so lightly. If your mother or father or you gave your son or daughter a gift, a car, a house, a jewelry, and it cost them nothing, and they went and threw it apart or treated it dirt, you could say, it's yours, I gave it to you, but you can't profane my kindness and grace to you that way. Sometimes children don't think they need of money. So I will give my sons $20 to go to Dwayne Reed and get a few things. They lose the $20. Come back, I have $20 more. Whoa! It doesn't work that easily. You know, there's going to be some consequence. But to them, it's just, I had it, I lost it, can I have some more? You set up rules, I obey those rules, I don't obey the rules, whatever. We come from a presupposition that we're almost no big deal, God. But it is a big deal, God. He is very careful to let us know, shouting that it's a big deal. They cannot presume upon His grace. For sake of time, I'll just highlight an illustration for you. In Luke 13, you remember the tower falls on people. And the people with hearts like we have, this heart that looks at things wrongly sometimes, they asked Jesus the wrong question. They asked Jesus, why did God allow this tower to fall on these people? Jesus says, you're asking from the wrong perspective. Why did you not have the tower fall on you? See, do not presume from a position of innocence that these people are good, and why in the world would a tower fall on good people? Instead ask, why did the tower not fall on you? We must come with all of these rules and instructions and say, how could you even dare let me near you through these? Not, I can't believe Uzzah touched it and he died. Oh my goodness. It's a reorienting of who we are. And a reorienting of who God is. And I would say that is the purpose of the book of Leviticus. To declare that God is holy, you therefore must be holy. This is the idea behind all of those priests in chapter 15. Third section of the book. The Day of Atonement. It has its own section. Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement. This is the third section of Leviticus. This one single day. It's the heart and the center of the Pentateuch. 
It's the heart and the center of Leviticus. This one day, this day of atonement, it's the heart and soul of what has happened. For instance, Leviticus 16, verse. And this shall be a statue forever, that atonement be made for the people of Israel once a year for their sins. Atonement at one moment justified. In a single moment, by the blood of the sheep, we will be made just before God. Atonement at one moment, at this very moment, the blood of the Lamb is slain, and I will be right with God. And because of that, you can imagine how it's the pinnacle of everything that at this moment, these sinful people and a holy God will be met. It is the pinnacle of the book. Reconcile. And how was it pictured? So beautifully. One Lamb, the sins of the people were put on its head, and then it was cut, and it died. Propitiation. All of the wrath of God poured out on this lamb. The other, all the sins of the people were poured onto the sheep's head, the lamb's head, and it was sent out of the camp. Expiation. The sin and guilt is taken away. Propitiation, Jesus died on the cross. Expiation, the guilt and sin were taken away. This is pictured in the day of atonement. Jesus Christ takes the sins and dies and bears them away. But it was pictured in two innocent white lambs. That's what happened in the Day of Atonement. It was, honestly, my friends, as Ken Hughes says, it was a bloodbath. Gallons and gallons and gallons of blood were spilt on the Day of Atonement. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people had to be atoned for. Lambs were dead everywhere. Carcasses everywhere. Every Jewish person with the guilt and the ache building up saw all this blood and all this death. The priests on that day were like butchers more than they were holy men. All of this. Why? Because the sacrifices must be made. The instruction of how to be holy is ultimately not enough. Because in the end, even with all your detail to instructions, you're not in fact holy. You can approach the queen all you want so as not to offend but you will never be equal to the queen. And you can make all the sacrifices you want, but you will never, in fact, be holy. So we will kill. We will kill an animal to, at a moment's time, for one year, make peace with you and God. Mm. Leviticus 5. If anyone sins doing any of these things, the Lord's command ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then he realized his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. Trespass off, peace off, burn off, sin off, oh my goodness, off, off, off. Even now, you might tire of me talking about it. Could you imagine being a Jewish person, seeing it, experiencing it daily, yearly? Oh. And it is merely a shadow. Merely a shadow. The last section of the book of Leviticus, the fourth and last section, chapters 17 through 27, it's often called the holiness code. <coughs> what does it mean to be holy? I've said that God is holy and we are not, and all these instructions are trying to show a way to make something right so that we can fellowship. But what in fact is holy? Well, in the basic, most basic way, it's something that is set apart for something else. It's something that has been cut or separated from the whole for a common purpose no longer, but now to be used for special things. Persons or things, in its most basic sense, can be holy. Days can be holy, ground can be holy, spouses can be holy, people can be holy, you can be holy. You can be cut apart, separated from the whole, consecrated over to a thing, which is God's work and God's name. This is why the New Testament says that we are already saints. I said at the very beginning, I greet you from the saints at Brooklyn Baptist. 
they are cut apart, separated from the whole, and were at regeneration, they are a people that are holy to God. Now, they have personal sanctification issues, like we all do, but they have been saved and set apart. They themselves are priests. So whether it be garments or cities or promises or men or hands or kisses, these things can be holy, set apart. But we all know that's not enough. We all know that God is not just set apart, set apart, set apart. Different, different, different. Holy has more than just different. Now, if you think I struggle with it, C.S. Lewis did as well, which gives me comfort. In the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there was a little mouse called Rebichi, if you remember. Rebichi, near the end of his life, on a cork, going to over the waterfall with the picture of heaven, life eternal. This is what it was said. The gallant mouse sails to the end of the world in his little corkle. It's like the word holy is. It's a little boat in which we reach the world's end of language. That's right. Like, we are pressing ourselves to the point of absurdity if we try and fully understand what it is that God is holy. He is distinct from us. He's wholly different from us. But how would you explain it? It's more than we sin and he does not. It's way more than that. Because that and Eve before the fall, they were not like God, but they had not sinned, but they were not like God. Blasphemy. So what is it in this idea? It's more than just moral quality. It's more than just separate. Separate from what? God is holy. Separate from what? He's separate from everything. You mean kind of everything? No. There's nothing that can be compared to Him. He is different, holy from us. There's no way with the words of language, like Ripachi and C.S. Lewis, there's no way to pull the immensity or the difference or the nature of God to us. There's no way. Because what you and I normally do is we go to qualitative differences or quantitative differences. He's more of this than me. It's way more than that. He's more holy, good than me. <laughs> it's not even right. He's so much different. He's wholly other than we. We are the creation. He's the creator. You can't create like you. You're wholly different than it. I tried. This week I was thinking of illustrations to help describe it, and I said to somebody, or let's say you were trying to explain to somebody, what is a rabbit? How would you explain a rabbit to somebody? <clears throat> you might say, he's a small, furry mammal. He has long ears, and he chews cut. Small? Compared to what? An elephant? Are you saying that you're small compared to God, like a, like, a, like a rabbit is to an elephant? Crazy. Unbelievable. He's infinite. How could you compare the size? He's furry. Well, like a cat or like what my daughter's stuffed in. So, I mean, what do you mean? He chews cut. I mean, like, I mean, he has ears like an elephant has ears. The point is, you will stretch to try and liken it something with a metaphor, but you are trying to deal with things here that are things up there. He is only not just bigger than we are, or smarter than we are, or stronger than we are. He is God, and we are not. This is the truth, my friends. He's one of a kind. He is the definer of what is. The Bible says it this way. What I'm trying to say in five minutes, here's the way the Bible says it. Isaiah 40, 25. To whom will you compare me that I should be like anything else? See? What will you say? 1 Samuel 2. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none God. There is no God beside you. There is no one like God. There is no thing, no person like God. God is trying to scream, if I may say it that way, in Leviticus, that He is holy other. And your goodness, and your faithfulness, and your deep 
details will not yet breach the path. It cannot be breached. He is the standard. You must be holy. But what? You say, well, then what's the point? No, 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 no. Remember what I said at the very beginning. The little boy named Levi or Joshua or Abraham, he's glad for the picture. He loves the one-dimensional picture because it isn't sufficient, but it will at the moment do the job. So let's turn our Bibles to Leviticus 26, verse 3. Almost done. Almost done. Leviticus 26, 3. And I, I think that Matthew Shores preaches longer than I am, so we're okay, I think. All right? I think. My people are, are that's it. I hope there's no pop to the other. They're in trouble. But you guys will make it, I think. Leviticus 26, 3. So, what's the point? He's holy other. What do we do? Please, do not oversimplify. Do not be too reductionistic. The Bible gives us answers of how to meet this God. Leviticus 26, 3. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, oh goodness, I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers. And I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you'll have to move it out of my room to make room for more. See, now, don't so much focus on the harvest, but he is saying this. If you do what I said you should do, if you obey my commands, I'll bless you. I will provide a means to fellowship with this holy other God. He continues, I will put my dwelling place among you. How, how does a holy God do that? Grace. I will put my holy dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk, walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. Listen, Woodside. Love the Lord your God this way. His grace, though holy other, and cannot be compared to anything, He said, I will make a way for you to be blessed and to have fellowship with me. An aardvark could sooner fellowship with a zebra than you and I fellowship with God. An ant or a flea can sooner fellowship with the Great Wall of China. You think that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> exactly. I'm submitting to you that a flea can more easily fellowship with the Great Wall of China than a man or a woman in this room with God. Because at the very least, the flea is created and so is the wall. But you and I are created, but not God. He is infinite, eternal. He is whole. And yet, God provides a way. God provides a way. He's so kind that way. Leviticus 9, 22 says this, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and peace offering. So listen, if you know the context, there's a plague going on. God is pouring out his wrath. Aaron, the high priest, offers the offering according to the law. And the next verse, 23, And Moses and Aaron went to the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared. It worked! It worked. If you obey what I said you should do, I will bless you and I will dwell with you. I am making a means. I am showing a way to meet me, your holy God. All right. Now let's get to the heart of the matter. We'll be done. The heart of it. Why? The wall doesn't care about the fleet. Zebra doesn't care about the art art. God is holy. Why would he condescend of men of low estate? Why? I mean, he's the most happy being in all the world. He's the most content. 
He's the most supreme. Which is to say, all of those will be summed up as he's holy. Why? The shadow and the reality is love. It's love. It's for love. Why? For love. And his own glory. Because it is very glorious of him to do what he's doing on our behalf. Shadows, they fail. Systems, they end. Priests, sacrifices, and rituals, no longer because the reality has come in Jesus Christ. Think of a little boy in a store. Think of my daughter in Sunset Park one time years ago. She was lost. Scared. A little boy in a store, lost, scared. He's been looking, he's searching, he's frantic, he's sad, he's scared. Finally, he sees on the ground a shadow that looks like his mom. And that shadow alone brings him great hope. He is very happy to see the shadow. Nothing wrong with the shadow. He sees it, he's happy, she's near. How much more when he embraces the mom? That's good. This is better. Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament provided shadows that gave those people great hope. They were happy. They were encouraged. But then Jesus comes, and the reality is here. Now, face to face. Now, without the Lamb. Now, without the temple rift. Without all these rituals, we come to Jesus. This morning, I prayed for you. And I prayed for my church. I did not call a priest up and I did not kill any animals. I might have run over somebody in Queens. <laughs> Listen, my friends. No more. That veil is gone. That partition is gone. I now have my God. I asked why. Why? The first and only biblical answer if you're looking at the London Baptist Confession is the glory of God. The second Second, for love of his people. For God so loved. First John 4, in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for us. Since we fail, my friends. We do fail, I fail, because we often forget that it is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, Luke 12. God did not out of constraint with one arm tied behind his back and this Levitical system forcing him to meet with us. It's not the way it is. God for joy, for love for his saints, for his people, for joy he makes a way. Sometimes it's so phantasmal we just can't fathom. Conclusion. God, and I hope I'm saying this respectfully, and I think I have the scriptures to support this, God has done everything that needed to be done. God knocked over every obstacle. And my friends, if I've done anything, I've tried to show you that the obstacles between him and us are so many. He has gone over all those barriers and knocked out all those obstacles to be with you. He is holy. And he has made a way for you to be with him. Are you holy? It is difficult for us to even fathom the work and the effort, if I could say that, of God sending his son to the world to die for sinners, to reconcile his people unto himself. It's hard to imagine all of that work and we do not pursue Him. How many times do I hear from people in my church, young men or young women, I'm doing this, I'm writing these texts, I'm sending an email, I'm liking this picture on Instagram, I said yes to this, I'm trying to do all I can, but it seems like I'm the only one working in this relationship. I guess He does it like me. I don't know what else to do. I mean, I even liked His grandmother's photos. I'm trying to let it be known that I am in the camp ready to go. <laughs> oh, I'm 
Keep Mike and Ford. Or Cheryl, that's the word. Yeah, Cheryl. <laughs> Respectfully, my friends, God has done so much by giving His Son for His glory and for your good and salvation that He has shown you that you are the apple of His eye, that He has set this particular special love on you. Love God. Be holy. Be zealous for God. He is zealous for you. He is zealous for you. He has pursued you to such ends. Even if you look at the Old Testament system, He pursued them to such great degree, how much more? That's why it's a better covenant. Now you say, should I just separate and cut myself from everything else? Is that to show I'm holy? That's one particular way to look at it. It could be in zeal, do not be slothful, but fervent for the Lord. It could be in our heart's meditation. It could be in our desires. It could be in our dreams. It could be in the fact that we have passion for lost souls. There's so many ways that we could be holy. To pursue Him the way He pursued us. I end the way I began. Leviticus is shouting that God is not unconcerned about every detail. But then, through Calvary, He breaks that bridge. He does justify us and declare us holy so those sacrifices are done away with. And our job on this side of the cross is to pursue Him as a believer with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if we are an unbeliever, we just cower under the ability to know what God did for us. And we are meek and humbled by it all. We repent of our sins and we come under that grace of all those truths for us. That's why I'm done. That's why in Romans 12, that language is there. I will give my life a living sacrifice. I will be the lamb as an already bought person to give all that I am. See, that language is intertwined. You and I are the quote unquote sacrificial lamb, but we are also the priest that presents ourselves to him. God is holy. What side? Be holy. Be zealous. Be fervent for the Lord. That's you are kind of Kind is the strongest word we can think of. You are loving, you are gracious, you are kind. You are kind in Leviticus. You are kind in Genesis when you promised the Messiah. You are kind when you made a way once a year to make atonement for sin. But, oh, Father, you were kind to send your Son, Jesus, the Lamb without spot or blemish, take away the sins. And now, Father, as born-again saints, as people who have been declared righteous, set apart for you, may we be bold, may we have a zeal for your name and for your glory. Thank you for all the details in Leviticus, every single last one of them, because every one of them, every tiny little command, shouts, declares, yells, you are holy. And we are not. Thank you, Father. Which in your name we pray. Amen.